Brazil's Supreme Federal Court has upheld the decision to annul all the convictions against former President Luis Ignacio Lula Silva and restore his political rights. Europe is reporting some 1.6 million new COVID-19 cases each week, having already surpassed 1 million COVID-19 deaths as the region becomes the epicentre of the ongoing pandemic. Negotiations to bring the United States back into a landmark nuclear deal with Iran resumed this Thursday in Vienna against a complicated black backdrop. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South and I'm Katrina Goss. Brazil's Supreme Federal Court has upheld the decision to annul all the convictions against former President Luis Ignacio Lula Silva, ruling that the criminal court located in the city of Curitiba that convicted him did not have the jurisdiction to do so. The top court's plenary reached a majority to uphold the earlier ruling issued by Justice Edson Fachin on March 8th, which annulled all the convictions against the former president and restored his political rights, meaning that the former president is eligible to run for political office again. Brazil's Supreme Court ruled at the end of March that former judge Sergio Moro, who was later appointed Justice Minister by Fire President Jair Bolsonaro, was biased in the way that he oversaw former, Lula, former President Lula's corruption trial, providing vindication for the leader who was subjected to political persecution. Lula was imprisoned for 580 days and banned from running for president in 2018. And another lawfare case has fallen apart in Brazil where the Federal Court of Accounts ruled this Wednesday that former President Dilma Rousseff was not guilty of financial losses incurred in the purchase of a U.S. refinery in Pasadena, California, by the state-owned oil company Petrobras in 2008. The court ruled that there was no premeditation or malice in Rousseff's actions while evaluating the transaction. In 2006, Rousseff was a minister and board member of oil giant Petrobras and voted in favour of purchasing the refinery. Petrobras then paid the equivalent of $360 million for 50% of the assets to the Belgian company Astra Ore, which had bought the entire plant for just $42.5 million a year before. Later, the former president explained she did not have access to all the information necessary on the acquisition. The charges against Rousseff were part of the same judicial operation labelled Lava Jato or Operation Car Wash, in which former President Luis Ignacio Lula Silva was wrongly accused of accepting bribes. The United Nations has warned of a possible humanitarian crisis in St Vincent and the Grenadines due to the eruptions of La Soufre volcano. The organisation reported that the volcanic activity could prevent the island's population from accessing essential goods. It reported that many of the poorer sectors in the area are not getting enough drinking water, while locals are forced to endure long queues. The UN called on the international community to enhance solidarity with the island of St Vincent, which has been receiving emergency aid from neighbouring countries, including Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Grenada and Venezuela. The water problem that I will say is not so much a problem here only, it is a national problem. But we are trying to rectify that problem. Presently, we are erecting some more washrooms so that instead of people waiting in long line, they can move more freely. And by do having more washrooms, we are eliminating COVID-19. Because when you have to line up behind each other, they may not do the three feet distance. So with having more washroom, people can freely move about, go in and come out at the same, at different intervals. All right, so um, here we are at the Evisha Methodist School. We are currently housing 37 evacuees. Most of them came from Overland, Sandy Bay and Jashrang as well. Majority of the evacuees here are family members with roughly four of them being single males. Yes, we received help from Nemo roughly the same day that the, the um, volcano erupted, which was rather rapid. And um, we also received help from outside donors as well, private donors. Yeah. In Colombia, the Institute for Peace and Development Studies on Thursday denounced the assassination of one of the signatories to the 2016 peace accords in the department of Meta. Since the signing of the peace accords, 265 signatories have been killed. The latest victim of the escalating violence in the country was Faber Camilo Cofinho Mondragon. Meanwhile, the assassination of another social leader was also reported in the Department of Antioquia.
Luis Octavio Guterres Montes died in the early hours of Wednesday due to wounds caused by a firearm attack last Tuesday. Gutierrez, who was a dentist, also worked as a hospital manager in the municipality of Caucasia, where he had reportedly denounced acts of corruption within the hospital. Local authorities denounced the attack and called for investigations to identify the perpetrators. Meanwhile, residents also staged protests demanding justice and an end to the violence. I request that all competent authorities immediately undertake all investigations to ascertain the identity and whereabouts of the material and intellectual authors of this event. A strong rejection of the attacks against the medical mission, against the man who was carrying out a very important task in the management of the hospital. Meanwhile, people close to Luis Octavio Guterres Montes denounce a lack of action by authorities to prevent the killing of social trade union and community leaders in the country. We don't understand how, after 20 years in Utuango, where there are guerrillas, where there are paramilitaries, nothing happens to him. And in Caucasia, only taking a year to attempt against the life of Luis Octavio. On Wednesday, Mexico's lower house of Congress approved reforms to the hydrocarbons law, which allow for the suspension of permits for foreign private companies to import and sell gasoline and other fuels, and the intervention of facilities that sell stolen or contraband fuel. The initiative is part of President Andrés Manuel López Obrador's efforts to strengthen Mexico's sovereignty over the energy market. It reverses past policies that gave transnational corporations advantages over the state oil company Pemex in terms of fuel distribution and marketing. Permits can now be revoked when an imminent danger is foreseen to national security, energy security or the national economy. President Obrador is committed to fighting speculation as well as large-scale fuel theft and smuggling. The bill passed with 292 votes in favour, 153 against and 11 abstentions, in spite of the usual threats by foreign companies that they would cut foreign investment and there would be job losses as a result of its implementation. The bill now passes to the Senate. For the fourth consecutive day, people took to the streets of Minnesota to demand justice for the murder of Don T. Wright, a young African-American. Protesters condemned the continued police brutality against the African-American community and demanded justice from the authorities in the Wright case and others. Despite measures issued by the local government to prevent demonstrations, protesters warned they will remain on the streets until a sentence is issued against Kim Potter, responsible for shooting Wright dead. The latest example of systemic racism by the police has shaken a city already on edge as the George Floyd murder trial draws to an end. In the meantime, residents of Atlanta joined the protests against police brutality and systemic racism following the murder of Dante Wright. Citizens marched in the Centennial Olympic Park demanding justice for all African-American victims of prevailing discrimination in the United States. This Thursday, the defence in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd wrapped up its case after just two days of testimony. Derek Chauvin declined to testify, invoking his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination and sacrificing the chance to explain to the jury why he kept his knee on Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes. But he also avoided a minute interrogation of his actions and thinking by the prosecution's cross-examination. Judge Peter Cahill set closing arguments for Monday, April 19th, after which jury deliberations will begin. The former officer is facing charges of second-degree murder, third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter for George Floyd's death, which sparked protests against systemic racism and police brutality around the world. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. On Thursday, a top official from the World Health Organization stressed that about 1.6 million new COVID-19 cases are reported each week in Europe, where the death toll has already passed 1 million. According to Dr. Hans Kludge, regional director of the WHO in Europe, the situation remains very serious. He emphasized the continent must keep up its guard with social distancing and speed up vaccinations as new virus strains drive infections to record levels in some nations. A tally by Johns Hopkins University shows nearly 3 million deaths linked to COVID-19 worldwide, with the United States, Brazil and Mexico reporting the highest number of fatalities, collectively representing more than 1.1 million.
The first batches of the Serbian-produced Russian Sputnik V vaccine will be released by early June, according to the country's president, who made the announcement while visiting Belgrade's Torlak Virology Institute. Serbia is also planning to produce the Chinese Sinovac jab as of October this year. We will try to produce a total of 20 million vaccines in the beginning, and after that aim for 30 million, so we could secure all that is needed for Serbia, not only Serbia, but also the broader region. We can be healthy if everyone around us is sick. We intend to develop both scientific research and production, everything that is necessary for us to become a superpower in vaccine production in the next 10, 12 years. India reported a record high of more than 200,000 new COVID-19 cases in the past 24 hours, taking a total tally to over 14.2 million, according to data released by the Health Ministry on Thursday. In trying to cope with the crisis, the Indian government suspended celebrations of Holi, the popular Hindu festival of colours, back in March. But thousands ignored the ban and took to the streets anyway. Over 1,000 new COVID-19-related fatalities were also reported in the past 24 hours, bringing a death toll so far to over 174,000. The suspension of air travel between France and Brazil this week is another blow to an economy severely impacted by the pandemic and another sign that until infection rates come under control, there will be little chance for a return to a norm normality. France joins a list of nations that have restricted or halted flights to Brazil. But travellers continue to arrive despite a surge in infections that has caused restrictions in major cities like Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. And even though pre passengers must present a negative COVID-19 test before departure and submit a medical questionnaire to the Brazilian Government Health Agency. The mayor of the Brazilian city of Rio de Janeiro, Eduardo Paes, has tested positive for COVID-19 once again, a year after his first infection. The official said he was feeling very well despite having flu symptoms after testing positive. The state of Rio de Janeiro, with 17 million inhabitants, has accumulated 40,000 COVID-19-related deaths, with 300 confirmed in the last 24 hours. It's among the five most affected states in the country, with a rate of 232 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants. Despite the record death figures in recent months and several new strains of the coronavirus ravaging the country, the city of Rio de Janeiro announced last week the easing of restrictions on hospitality businesses and other activities. But I am doing really well. The symptoms are a bit like this feeling of a flu-like condition. I am taking care of myself here at home, monitoring the city of Rio online, talking to the secretaries by video. So, anyway, everything will be fine. I will take care of my health and you take care of yourself, because this story is not a joke. Argentine President Alberto Fernandez announced an extension of a night curfew and the closure of schools in the Buenos Aires metropolitan area in a toughening of the measures to curb the spread of COVID-19. The South American country has almost five times as many new cases per day compared to a month ago when the average was 6,000, with the latest figure reaching 25,000. It will be held virtually for two weeks starting Monday. Teachers, non-teaching staff and students will not be required to attend classes. The other measures will come into effect at zero hours on Friday. From zero hours on Friday until April the 30th, all the activities I have mentioned will be restricted, including circulation on the streets. We have to understand the crucial moment we are living in and know that I have no political interest in what I am proposing to you today, that I am not here proposing these things to see how I can make political profit, that the only thing that matters to me is preserving health. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Negotiations to bring the United States back into a landmark nuclear deal with Iran were soon this Thursday in Vienna. Meanwhile in Tehran, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani said Iran will return to its uranium enrichment commitments as soon as U.S. sanctions are lifted. The Joint Commission is resuming its meeting today. Over the past two days we have held tight consultation with various delegations. Today we will restart our work in a more formal manner. Under no circumstances do we seek talks of attrition or talks that just take time or negotiations for the sake of negotiations only. We will declare it clearly today and move in this path. If talks proceed towards a constructive direction that we expect, they will obviously continue. If not, they will stop. 
In Iraq, an explosion shook a market in East Baghdad on Thursday, killing one person and injuring 12 others. The blast is the second in the Iraqi capital this year. The Baghdad police chief told local media that the explosion was caused by a car bomb. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack. The incident came hours after drone strikes targeted US-led coalition troops near Erbil airport and a Turkish military base in the north of the country. There is no immediate confirmation of any link between the two attacks and no claim of responsibility. Some 20 bomb or rocket attacks have targeted bases housing U.S. soldiers or diplomats in Iraq since U.S. President Joe Biden took office, while the demand that all foreign troops withdraw from the country is still to be met. A Russian response to the latest United States sanctions is inevitable, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Sakharova warned on Thursday as the U.S. Ambassador to Moscow, John Sullivan, was summoned to the ministry to be briefed. The United States announced economic sanctions against Russia earlier on Thursday and the expulsion of 10 diplomats in retaliation for what was described as electoral interference, massive cyber attacks and other hostile activities. Russia has denied the accusations. The new wave of sanctions came amidst escalating tensions in recent weeks, with Ukraine reinforcing its military presence on its borders with Russia, as well as reports of the deployment of two United States warships to the Black Sea, a move which has since been cancelled. The United States is not ready to come to terms with the objective reality that there is a multipolar world that excludes American hegemony. They are betting on sanctions and interference in our internal affairs. Such aggressive behavior is sure to be firmly countered. A response to sanctions is inevitable. Washington needs to understand that there is a price to pay for the degradation on bilateral relations. The responsibility for what is happening lies entirely with the United States. Myanmar security forces opened fire on Thursday at a demonstration of medical personnel in Mandalay. About 20 people were detained in a new day of protests against the military junta that seized power in February. At least 714 people have been killed by Myanmar's security forces since the February coup, with over 3,000 arrests, according to the Association for the Assistance of Political Prisoners. Aung San Suu Kyi, the deposed president, is also under arrest and awaiting trial on charges of promoting unrest, taking bribes and sharing state secrets. In spite of the shootings and repression, mass protests continue on the streets of Myanmar cities. A passenger train derailed on Wednesday in Egypt's Nile Delta, injuring at least 15 people, according to the health ministry. Local media reported that the governor of Sharkia, where the accident took place, said that two carriages of a train which was travelling from Cairo had come off the tracks. It was reported that another train heading in the opposite direction managed to stop and avoid a collision. It was not immediately clear what caused the train to derail. A similar incident in late March left over 30 victims. Egypt has one of the oldest and largest rail networks in North Africa and accidents causing casualties are common. Muslims in the South African township of Winterfield have said they will pe preach peace during the month of Ramadan. Many Muslim migrants pray at the local mosque of the township and many of them have fallen victim to the xenophobic attacks that often are up there. Our correspondent Matuba Malachi brings us the story. Ramadan is an important time in the Muslim calendar. Millions of economic migrants will be spending it away from loved ones in foreign countries. South Africa is home to many. What we do in the masjid, especially in Ramadan, by the way, the masjid, we always try to integrate communities in one way or the other, meaning that we hold meetings whereby we gather the brothers from different countries to come and sit down together and find solutions on different matters. Most of them are business people in this community, so they have your tax shops and wholesalers. So when a xenophobic attack breaks out, in most cases, this masjid is a refuge for them. Rahim Nkumani is part of South Africa's fast-growing black Muslims in the country's townships. He says diversity is at the heart of the Umvelingangi Masjid, and migrants feel at home. Now coming to the issue of Ramadan, every Ramadan we try to integrate with them as much as we can because uh, there's one very important element of Islam is that wherever you are in the world, we have a lot of similarities. In fact, we are the same as Muslims because the way we pray here is the same way they pray in uh, everywhere in the world. Somali-born Ismail Mohamed Kari goes to the Umvelingangi Masjid for prayer. 
He's been in South Africa for 11 years and is an established businessman. His business employs locals and it alleviates poverty in a struggling economy. We do no contribution to our local community. We try uh, our level best to employ locals, especially in our area. Uh, that is what we can do in our, our capability. Economic migrants tend to start new lives and families in their host countries. It's no different for many here. But for those who've just arrived, their place for prayer will also be home, especially now during Ramadan. Matuba Masachi, Telesur, Winterfeld in South Africa. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many of our stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.